If there's one thing I've always loved about modeling trains, it's the opportunity to make them look a little bit more realistic or grimy or just dirty overall. I'm a big fan of weathering, and today I thought it'd be fun to show you guys how I've weathered my Bachman Douglas, since the Bachman Donald and Douglas are the most recent reviews on my channel. And while admittedly I haven't really gotten around to doing much with Donald yet, with Douglas being my favorite of the two, I have put a little bit more time and effort into that model. So let's go ahead and get into what all I've done. As you can see, the uh, Douglas body itself hasn't really been modified much. The only thing I've done to the actual body is apply a matte coat, specifically the Mr. Hobby Super Matte, as well as removed his face and removed the chassis. The tender I've already started a little bit on, well, honestly, more than a little bit. I went ahead and did a good bit of weathering on this to get a feel for what I wanted to do for the entire model. And that's a good little trick I've learned for models like this, to start with the tender and from that follow up with the rest, since the body is normally the more important part. To do the weathering on Douglas, I'll be using a Monroe Models mini weathering kit. The one I happen to have here comes with desert sand, dirty white, dark earth, and new fresh rust. Basically everything you'd need for any model. But for Douglas, I won't be using the dark earth. I won't really need the brown. I'll also be using my go-to, of course, that being the Stardust Black Powder. To this day, I've not found anything that works better for soot or coal dust weathering, and of course, the Mr. Hobby Top Coat, which I mentioned earlier. As well as multiple paintbrushes, since I do my best not to mix the powders. At least directly, I try to do that more on the model. And the main goal here is just to produce something a little bit more unique, as well as realistic, so I will be using the uh, original models as reference, but also kind of doing my own thing. I also want to give a huge shout out to Sodor Rai Modeler and his blog spot, as recently he released a page on how he modified his Donald and Douglas, and it served as a big help as well as inspiration. So I'll have that linked in the description for anybody who's curious. And let's get back into weathering the model. Like I said before, I'm trying to go for a little bit more uh, realism with this model. So doing my best not to overdo it, I apply a bit more rust and a bit more powder in um, areas where it would make sense. For example, a little bit of soot on the smokestack or in front of the boiler door, and then using the white in spots where it would have been on the uh, actual models. Secure the Mars Observatory and return to Earth by docking in the 
returning Pluto battleship. Roger. We're all ready to go, sir. Captain Avatar's battleship will be on the Mars orbit in... Once I've reached a pretty good stopping point with the body, I go back to do a little bit more on the tinder. Using the yellow and the rust, I focus a little bit more on the inside of the tinder and try to focus it more in the creases of the foot plate. And where I've added a little bit of extra coal, I do my best to weather around that as well. I also go back over the undercarriage and other parts of the model to make sure all of the powders that I set before are really there, and really help to pronunciate the weathering I want it to have. The twins are notoriously hardworking goods engines, and I want that to be exemplified with this model. Go, sir. Now, once I'm satisfied with the tender, I go back to the body shell. I haven't applied the top coat yet, so everything that I've done so far can be removed or changed, and that's kind of the way I like it to be. And honestly, lucky for me, since the weathering I did around the whistle was completely uneven. So I not only go back and fix this, but add a little bit more around the foot plate on the roof, a bit more black soot on the boiler, just, just go over it one more good time and make sure it's all really there. I guess it's better that you guys see it than hear me try to explain it. And once that was completed, the only thing left to do was add the top coat. And with that, the Douglas model was semi-completed. While the weathering portion may be done, there was a little bit more I decided to do. For example, I used a hole puncher to add some uh, cab windows. That was a super fun detail. And in time, plan to either repaint his original face or get him some new ones. Perhaps I'll even move his nameplates and give him handrails. But for now, this is the model. And I have to say, for being so basic, it's something I'm quite satisfied with. A good bit of weathering can really turn that around. And it's really fun to take a basic model and turn it into something that's basically anything but.
or at the very least a dirtier, simpler model, I guess. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is the process I've taken with my Douglas so far. I did add a little bit more coal inside of his tinder, but would like to add even more than I did, so I guess that doesn't really count. Weathered up and hopefully ready to turn some heads at the next train show I take him to. And hopefully you guys enjoyed figuring out the process and how I did so. If you guys did, be sure to like and subscribe for even more train content. Huge shout out to my patrons, and with all that being said, hopefully I'll see you guys in the next one. We can't drive sheep down the line. They wouldn't go straight. Silly, said Rex. We don't drive sheep. We take their wool in bales on trucks. It'll be easy. The small controller laughed. Very well, Rex, he said. You seem to know all about it. So you shall take the first train. Some of you guys may remember a while ago when I released a video talking about Z-Scale locomotives. And you probably could tell exactly what that meant. I wanted to make Arlesdale. And being that I mostly model HO and OO trains anyway, Z-Scale was really the only option. And following this, I did my best to set the fate before me into action. However, I would find this easier said than done. My first idea was to take the capsule play rail locomotives and then motorize those, something that Thomas Fan 247 did extremely well. However, I wasn't having a lot of luck finding chassis that really fit those tiny bodies. And admittedly, after my third or fourth attempt, I was pretty burnt out and didn't want to continue to keep throwing money at a project I wasn't sure I was going to be able to complete. It seemed the capsules just weren't going to cut it. But thankfully, there was an alternative. At the time, the options on Shapeways were quite limited. However, to my surprise, there was an OO in 6.5 River-esque, and the print itself contained almost everything I would need, save for buffers and the chassis for both the locomotive and the tinder. And honestly, after so many attempts of the capsules just not working, I kinda bit the bullet, and decided to get the shell for myself in the highest available quality plastic. It arrived pretty quickly, and the moment it did, work started, so let's go ahead and get into that first. So the natural first step was to sand the print down. Unfortunately, even in the highest quality, there will be some imperfections, and I did my best to smooth out his tinder and his main body as best I could. Around areas like his cab front, this was a bit harder to do, so those areas may not have the highest level of finish. But once I had completed what I could do, I decided to add on the primer, that being the Mr. Hobby light gray surfacer. And next would come his paint, specifically the TS-35 Park Green by Tamiya. I personally was torn between his Railway Series and his TV Series look, so I settled with a green kinda in the middle. And honestly really liked how that looked, so it was something I decided to run with. And pretty soon after, I popped the face off of the capsule, and that was that. The main green paint job was completed, but there still was the buffers and the chassis that needed to be completed as well. Altogether, the buffers were pretty simple, just being taken off of other Z-Scale locomotives and then put into the shell. They do look a little small, but at least they're there. In time, I may replace these. But next would come the chassis for the actual locomotive. In the actual canon, Rex is a 282, and unfortunately on hand, I didn't happen to have a 282 chassis. What I did have, however, was a 462 chassis, specifically the Marklin Mini Club 8836. And while it wasn't accurate, it did fit the best inside of the shell. And it was here I really made the decision to just kind of do my own thing and give my version of Rex a different configuration. Whenever I get around to making Bert and Mike, I'd like to keep their configurations the same rather than change those. But I also thought this would give Rex some variation, so there's that. The Tinder chassis was a spare one I happened to have. Unfortunately, I don't really remember the uh, locomotive this one came from. But I applied that to the bottom of the Tinder, added some weight, and that was really that. I cut the connector from the chassis off and glued it to the front of the tinder. And with that, not only was there a tinder connection, but the locomotive worked. And now what was left was detailing. I didn't really trust myself with a paintbrush uh, on something so small, so I had my wife help me out a lot with this model. And she applied the black on the footplate, the tinder, the smoke box, basically all the black you see was toned by her. Then using a red paint pen, I would come along and do his buffer beams and sides. Tester's metallic gold was used for his dome and his windows, and do not get me started on how hard it was to do those windows. I tried toothpicks, paint, it really just wasn't working out. Eventually, my wife had to help me with that too, and this was the cleanest we could get it, so it works for me. I painted the tinder chassis black to match the rest of him, added a filler cap on his tinder as well as the coal, and then took the headlamp from the capsule and put it on the new body. And that currently is where Rex stands. Unfortunately, not yet complete, but pretty far into it. And a project I'm still very proud of and excited to show off. 
Now, very clearly, he still needs his lining, he needs a driver, a lot needs to happen here until I can call this guy really done. But I think I've at least reached a good stopping point for a part one on this project. Hopefully, the next time you guys see this dude, he'll be basically complete. I have plans to get all of that done, add the Arlesdale on his tender. I do, however, want to take my time with it so I don't rush and potentially mess it up. So, for now, ladies and gentlemen, this is my Z-Scale Rex. Or I guess OO in 6.5 is the best way to put it, but Z-Scale sounds better. Very recently, I decided to fit the tender chassis with a Marklin coupler so he can actually pull rolling stock now too. So let's go ahead and see this dude in action. man look at this man if any of you guys would like to make a rex yourself i'll have the body shell linked in the description below and hopefully you guys enjoyed figuring out how i've done it so far while admittedly this project has been a tough one it honestly has been one of the more fun to complete and i'm honestly really excited to finally finish this guy this arlesdale project has loomed over me for a while now and to finally see it come to fruition is just awesome to me so that ladies and gentlemen is the story of rex so far there's still quite a bit to go, but even now I can say I'm happy, and expect more of him very, very soon. If you guys did enjoy this video, be sure to like and subscribe for even more trained content, help boost you boy in the algorithm, and as always guys, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one. This has nothing to do with Rex, but look at this tiny Thomas face. I just finished Wolf Focus. This thing is tiny, I'm proud of myself good on this one. What's up guys, my name is Train Boy, and I like to model trains. And recently I thought it'd be fun to give myself a sort of challenge project. That being an engage project. Not really 009 or 00Z, as those still fall into the 00 scale range. Instead, I wanted to work on a project that was strictly in scale. And those of you who watched my in scale Thomas uh, re-review, you know exactly what that is. Today we'll be taking a look at my in scale Tiny Tomo, which I recently finished and being my first in-scale project presented its own set of issues. So with all of that being said, let's go ahead and jump into it. Ladies and gentlemen, meet my son. So for those who don't know, the body shell itself is the little Tomo design made by Arlo, or Scarloey Boy on Twitter. This is that body shell, just scaled down to fit on the Bachman in-scale Thomas chassis. And once it was scaled down, it was printed by Tom T. Legend. Once the model arrived, work on it started pretty quickly, as it normally does and I pretty quickly had the print cleaned off and soon primed. After this, I would test fit the chassis to make sure it was a solid fit, and after giving the primer a sufficient amount of time to dry, applied the blue, specifically the Tamiya TS-10, or French blue. But before I would apply the blue, actually set down a darker coat of primer. Unfortunately, I didn't get a picture of this, but this was to make sure the blue set down a little bit darker as well. Next came adding his smaller details like the black smoke box and black foot plate, and this was done with hand brushing. I also hand brushed his buffer beams and used a paint pin on his sides. Tester's gold enamel was applied to his whistle, and then their silver on his buffers. And this is a part of the process I inevitably had to take quite a bit of time with. There were a few paint mishaps I had to go back and touch up. I would decide to add certain things or take certain things away. But once I had decided largely what I wanted the main paintwork to be, I sealed it in with a coat of matte clear, and also decided for some reason my Thomas would sport a gold funnel top. At first, I wanted this Thomas to resemble that of something in the illustrations, but as I would make it, decided to kinda go my own way with it, leaving the railway series shape, and more or less the blue, I guess. But as you'll soon see, and like I did with the funnel, I largely decided it would be more fun to do what I wanted to do, rather than try to follow something that's already been done. So once that step was done, I went on to adding his smaller details. For example, trying to paint his front cab porthole windows, I did not attempt the back and do not plan to, adding his lamp irons and lamp which came from a spare Bachman Thomas, and adding things like coal in the coal bunker. But that was really all I could do until I started with his lining, and I knew his lining would be a struggle in itself but had an idea to get around doing the lining, since as you guys know it's not something I'm the most skilled at. I also at this point decided to paint the chassis a darker blue, to try to get it to match the body shell a little bit more. 
Unfortunately, the blue still didn't match up exactly perfectly, but it was leagues better than it was before. Plus, I would find a way to match these up pretty well once I would go to weather the model, but we'll get into that shortly. I got in contact with RWS NWR12, and he actually made me some small transfers for him. Transfers that would not only handle the lining, but the one as well, and all I needed to do was figure out how to get it printed. Unfortunately, a lot of the places I asked said the design was too small for them. However, as she always does, my wife kinda came in clutch here, and it just so happened her mother actually made transfers herself. So I asked if she could print me some, and they actually ended up working perfectly. I pretty quickly had those applied to both sides. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to do the back since I had put a brake pipe there and didn't want to take it off. And soon, the tanks, the boiler stripes, everything I could apply was applied. And Thomas was starting to finally take shape. He had a railway series shape, an Ertl 1 and lining, a model series face, which was made by Rexecutions, and most importantly, a lot of soul. But there was still more I wanted to do to him. So for a while, I would go back and forth on whether or not I should weather him, and then decided, eh, I'm already this far, why not? And pretty quickly, that all happened as well. He was weathered the same way all of the models were, with the same Mini Monroe's model kit, as well as the Black Star Powder, and I also would weather his chassis with some panel line accent. This part of the weathering took quite a bit of time, but that was to make sure I didn't actually mess up the chassis, and to make sure what I put on was actually consistent, so I think it paid off. And once all of that was done, I sealed it all in with a coat of matte clear. And with that, the little Tomo was finally completed. And while yeah, I would like to add figures in his cab, or maybe get him some new faces, the main job itself is finally complete. And I have to say, as difficult as it was, it definitely ended up being one of the better projects I think I've ever done. And hopefully you guys enjoyed figuring out how exactly I did it. If any of you guys would like a Tomo yourself, be sure to get in contact with Arlo. He does these in not only in, but Tubbelo as well. And if you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe for even more train content, since there's always more stuff on the way. This has definitely inspired some future Engage projects, so expect Tomo to have some friends hopefully pretty soon, but also expect some updates in the Double O department as well. Working on these super small trains has reminded me how much I miss the somewhat larger trains, and how much easier it was to work on them comparatively, so soon I hope to get back into that a little bit more. But with all that being said, thanks again for watching guys, and hopefully I'll see you guys in the next one. When I first started modeling in Double O Gage, there was a project that hung over my head, specifically ever since I got my first Bachman Devious Diesel, and I knew one day I would eventually tackle it and give it a shot. I wanted to make the Class 08 twins from Thomas and the Magic Railroad, Splatter and Dodge, not only some of my favorite characters from that movie, but some of my favorite twin characters from the show in general. Or, I guess franchise, they never showed up in the show. And today, ladies and gentlemen, I can finally call half of this project almost complete. And by that I mean I've finally finished Splatter, or almost finished Splatter. He still needs his name decaling on the side, but besides that, everything else is complete. Minus Dodge, of course, but that also will hopefully be coming soon. And today we'll be taking a look at how I made this guy. Since you'd think a model like this would be pretty simple to make, right? Pretty much just a repaint of a diesel model, right? It, no, no, it's, it's much more complicated than that. Or at least it was for me. But let me not spoil too much, with all of that being said, let's go ahead and get into it. Before we talk about how I made Splatter, first I kinda wanna explain the current headcanon I have for him. Unfortunately, the only actual appearance of Splatter and Dodge we have is Thomas and the Magic Railroad itself. And that in itself is pretty canonically controversial. So, to some people, these two may not have even existed, which is pretty understandable, the movie itself is not for everybody. As you all know, however, I personally really enjoy it, so I have no problem with looking at it as canon. My idea was, after the events of the movie, and after the two betray Diesel 10, they're sent to work as shunters on more obscure parts of the island. This really technically could be anywhere, however, I personally chose Arlsdale. Since we never saw that in the model series, maybe they could have just been tucked away there, and that's also one of my favorite parts of the island of Sodor, so it just kind of works. The two would likely spend their days arranging ballast trains for the other locomotives to come and take, and while definitely less thrilling than being an evil character's sidekick, at least it works practically. 
And since right now I happen to be modeling that, it also kind of works out in that department. It's definitely not very flushed out, at least at this point. But that's the idea I had, and hopefully that helps moving forward. Now let's get into how I made this guy. So, he would originally start as a normal Bachman diesel model, one that was actually sent to me by Boldout95. We did a little bit of model trading, and soon I found myself with not only a new diesel shell, but a new diesel chassis, as well as five brand new printed faces, four of which had already been painted and completed by him. Note, these were designed by Thomas Modeler Fan 96 and George was even kind enough to help me fill the areas on the side where the ladders used to be, something that unfortunately in the past I had struggled with before. I guess I'm just not the best with Tamiya Putty, but thankfully he's pretty skilled in that department and helped out a ton. The faces themselves are a little small. They don't actually fill the entire front area where Diesel's face used to be. So to fix this, I would sand down the entire front of the diesel shell, removing all the lamps and smaller details. Once this was sanded smooth, a piece of plastic card was applied to the front, with a hole cut in the middle so the blue tacked eyes have room to sit. Unfortunately, at the moment, I didn't have many spare lamps on hand, so I decided to settle with giving him one headlamp, actually being a Tomix Thomas tail lamp. Unfortunately, not the right scale, but it definitely looked the part. And once those were applied, priming pretty much immediately started. The cap was removed from the back portion of the shell so I could paint that separately. And once the model was primed in a light gray, I would go back over it in a dark gray. And actually ended up kind of liking the look of it, so this would serve as the base coat. The cap was painted purple and detailed separately. And once the gray on the main body had dried, the first thing I did was mask off the areas on the body that would remain gray. And spray the parts that needed to be purple, purple. Thankfully, the first time around was a pretty clean job, but being that I was working with spray paint, there was some imperfections. Eh, don't worry though, we'll get back to that soon. Next came painting his lower half and his buffer beams. For this part, I decided against using a spray, and instead sat down and hand-painted the black onto him. With the help of my wife, of course, I do not have a steady hand. And with that, Splatter was really starting to take shape, and I decided to seal it all in with a coat of matte clear. Now we get back to those imperfections I talked about earlier. Now, matching a spray paint with a brush paint is normally near impossible. However, Tom T. Legend actually hipped me to a quick method, where you take spray paint and spray it directly into the lid of the can, and then use that as a sort of brush paint. I did this for not only the gray, but also the purple, and very quickly those previous spots started to disappear. I did start to notice a slight problem, however. The dark gray I had first laid was actually a slightly different tone from the gray I was now laying, likely due to the matte clear coat I had applied before, and getting those two to match up without repainting the entire model would be pretty difficult. However, I had a method for how I would get around this, so now let's go ahead and get into the weathering portion. Splatter was at first weathered like a normal model would be, using black and different rust powders to really bring out his smaller details, or at least attempt to. I quickly found I didn't really like the look of it. It was then my wife had a pretty genius idea. Why not just make him look like he was from the sneezing powder scene? Which is actually one of my favorite scenes from the movie. I actually really enjoyed that idea. So, I got a little crafty, put an extra layer of white weathering powder on the body, and then used my white and gray spray paints to dust the model from the bottom side up, to make it look like the dust has been kicked up onto him, and followed this along the entirety of the body. Not only did this help to cover up the paint problem, but also really helped to hide his brush strokes. So thankfully that idea worked out a lot better than I thought it would. I threw some three-link couplers onto his front and back, painted the front part of his lamp white, reattached the buffers and smaller detail. By the way, quick note, I know some of this detail is not present on the actual splatter model, but I just kind of wanted to have it for my model. It's a free country. And that was pretty much that for the painting and weathering portion. I decided to add a figure on the side of Splatter, since unfortunately his stepladder has a little bit of damage. I put the double O scale figure kind of low hanging to help to hide this, and make it look like Splatter has someone watching him or the wagons he's pulling. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, Splatter was for the time complete. Like I said before, I still need to get his name decaling and plan to do that, so expect an update on this guy soon. Unfortunately, I just haven't gotten around to it at this point, and I couldn't be more happy to finally have at least one of the twins on the railway. Some of you guys may remember, a while ago I actually tried to make a Dodge model. However, altogether that model was quite sloppy, and it's something I'm hoping to redo. It even had Diesel's ladders, I mean, come on. So for now, Splatter will have to work by himself, but here's to hoping that changes relatively quickly. And that, ladies and gentlemen, has been my Splat- 
Wait. What? What is that? No. No. Really quick, yes, I know Splatter was not the Mad Bomber. Splatter was not even in the Mad Bomber series. That would have been Mute, or Bluebell, as was recently revealed. But it's one of my favorite YouTube videos ever. I wanted to pay homage to it. It is what it is. If you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe for even more train content. There's always more stuff on the way. And as always guys, thanks again for watching, and hopefully I'll see you guys in the next one. Some of you guys may remember a short film I made a while ago called In Your Honor, or 2308, which more or less reimagined the backstory of James, as well as completely took his basis and flipped it on its head. James is canonically not a Dean Goods. He is technically an LNYR Class 28, and more or less has been since Audrey created him, or decided that for him. I don't know about you guys, but I never really liked this basis. But James aside, did have an affinity for the Dean Goods. One day a while ago, me and my brother were talking about this, and the idea of making James such came about. It wasn't an idea I took very crazily at first. I definitely enjoyed it, but it was more just something fun. I mean, one of my favorite classes of engine being turned into my favorite character, it just kind of worked out. And while I knew many people wouldn't agree with this basis, it was still something I thought would be fun. And him being more into history than trains, we talked about what the exact backstory would be. Just kind of bouncing ideas back and forth and trying to create a narrative for the character. As those of you who have already watched 2308 likely know, my brother actually recently passed. It was then the smaller idea I had turned into something a little bit more serious. And in his honor, I wanted to officially make the story and finally make the locomotive as well. Hence the name of the short film. I got the Oxford Rail 2308 model and quickly got to work. With the original modifications being as simple as simple could get. Remove the smoke box door, add a face, add some smaller details from the detail pack. And while I wanted to weather him and maybe even add a front pony truck, I ultimately decided against this, as these models aren't necessarily the cheapest, and I didn't want to hold production back even longer. For filming purposes, I would settle with leaving the model largely as is. Since then, 2308 has went through quite a few changes, but nothing really too drastic. He now features a larger and much fatter face, which some people hate, but I have to say I quite enjoy. I don't know, it just feels very Audrey to me. And every day I'm back and forth with finally weathering the model since I'm a little bit more experienced now. But as you can see here, it's still not something I've actually done yet. As much as I love 2308 and the unique livery it has, I couldn't help but constantly imagine what James would look like if he was actually a Dean Goods, or more specifically, a Dean Goods in red. And this was a project I was inevitably going to do after making 2308. So one day recently, I bit the bullet and got a new Dean Goods, this time in the black World War II livery. And my plans for this one were quite simple. Make an actual James model, or something that at least resembled James, livery-wise. The model was pretty quickly primed, even though I did sport it for quite a while in just the normal black livery. I don't know, I like wartime liveries, you guys know me. But this wouldn't last for too long, and eventually the model was coated in Tamiya primer. I let this dry for about a day or two, and then came in with my red Tamiya spray paint, specifically the TS-8, or Italian Red, and again waited about a day for that to sit. Once the red had dried, I wanted to add some smaller details in black. And that was all applied pretty quickly, and thankfully pretty nicely, since I did have a little bit of help. My wife is often pretty good at fixing the mistakes I make in painting, or just doing what I say I can't. So soon James's tinder was done, his wheel arches were done, his footplate was done, basically his main paintwork was complete. And though it looked a little bit shocking, you know, without a front pony truck and all, it was something I really enjoyed the look of. There was one thing I knew James needed, however, and that was lining, as well as a number 5 to go on his tinder. So I sent him off to Lego Master, and he actually did all of that for me. And here are some amazing behind-the-scenes pictures of what that looked like, all of which come from him. James? He asked. Why are you red? 
I am a splendid engine, answered James, ready for anything. You never see my paint dirty. Oh, that's why you once needed bootlaces, to be ready, I suppose. <laughs> I commissioned that from him and very quickly got the model back. However, unfortunately, USPS doesn't really often like model trains, and the box would take a couple of bumps, thus meaning the lining itself came off in a couple of places, and unfortunately was a bit bumpy because of that. It was at this moment I had a choice. I could either send him back and get him relined, I could try to paint it over, or I could do what I was always scared to do with 2308, and that is weather the hell out of the model. And that's kind of what I did. If James is already going to be a Dean Goods and look nothing like how people expect him to, why not make him dirty as well, and just go all out on a very unique James? I plan on using him for freight work anyway. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the final product. Here is my custom, very dirty, and very unique Dean Goods James. Or as I sometimes call him, the Big Red Bloke. And I have to admit, for being a model that ended up more freelance than anything, I really enjoy the final product. I was back and forth with extending his running plate and adding a pony truck for a while, but I want this model to match 2308 more closely, despite being painted to look more like James. Maybe one day I'll buy a third Dean Goods and extend that running plate, but for now, here is the duo. Finally seeing a red Dean Goods next to 2308, at least in my mind, really just affirmed that he and I had a good idea, and hopefully he enjoys it just as much as I do, since at the end of the day, this is more or less all in his honor. Relatively outdated, the British Sugar Corporation, or BSC, hosts some of the finest locomotives on British rail. Hearing an approach to complete dieselization, some may gawk at the sight of two out-of-date steam engines marshalling lengthy trains, but work they do despite this. Locomotive number one, built in 1940 by Brighton, is the last of its class to be developed, and as such has been modified from his brethren in multiple ways. Featuring six small wheels, a short stumpy funnel, a short stumpy dome, and a short stumpy boiler, as well as a larger coal bunker and extended side tanks to boot, only serving to strengthen our number one on those long farm trips. It's remained here at Woodston its entire life, hauling wagons of beef from the farms to our factories, and couldn't be happier to do so. For why would you want to see the world when this is your world? <laughs> All right, now shut up. You know, if there's one thing most Thomas and Friends fans have in common, it's that at some point you're likely to develop an alternate universe. And what I mean by that is you're going to have your own takes on characters, maybe scenarios. At some point, you're gonna take the story and fit it to your own preferences. And it's honestly kind of inevitable, seeing as there's three main canons. One, the railway series. Two, the model series, which was the beginning of the television series. And three, the CGI series, which is the latter half of the television series. If you're anything like me, you like something from all three of these series, and you try to take things from all three and make your own, kinda. In some cases, maybe not even featuring any of the three at all. And this is something I've done for a while, but only recently have started to model, and today I thought it'd be fun to show you guys the first model of that alternate universe, coincidentally being Thomas, the number one engine. Now, I think it'd be fun to explain the design behind him since he is a little bit different, but also the story behind him since there's a reason for that. But I want to mention really quick, I haven't gotten too in-depth into my personal universe. It's not, um, the most flushed out, so expect little details to change over time and maybe certain things to get added. But for what I have now, ladies and gentlemen, this is Thomas, or at least my version, and here is why he 
is the way he is. I don't know what that is. That sounds scary. So, kind of like you saw in the intro, canonically, my Thomas is based on the Hudswell and Clark 1800. And though this is an E2 and the completely wrong class, I still wanted it to resemble it in some way, thus leading to his simplistic livery. But it wasn't just that that inspired me. Recently, my good friend Magic Railway Studios finished a Thomas of his own that I fell in love with, that didn't feature any lining, didn't feature a one on the side, but still managed to be the most unique Thomas I had ever seen, and pop so well. I feel like I'm the only person who thinks this, but I think no lining and a more simplistic look makes the engines look more realistic. And while in some cases lining is definitely better, it's not something I'm crazy about myself. Not every model has to have it. And not every engine had it as well, specifically the Hudswell and Clark 1800, at least before it was Thomas. So this Thomas is very much the same. Not featuring any lining or a one on the side, it's just blue with a black footplate, red buffer beams, a gray bunker which was inspired by Magic's white bunker, and a bit of airbrush weathering to discolor that blue and make it pop a bit more, which was done on the body, the cab, and the wheels, all separately but done in the same fashion so they match. The face was actually not meant to be a Thomas face. This was meant to go on the old engine, or 1020, another model that I'm working on right now. And I had two faces for him and ended up painting one face a little too much. I put too much primer on it and his eyes were a lot bigger than they were supposed to be. I put it to the side for a while, brought it back out, tried to repaint it, and then repurposed it for Thomas's face. And was pretty much in love with it, it feels very illustration-esque. But no proper Thomas model is complete without a number one, and being that this is Thomas, it's pretty right that he should have one. So I decided to put those on his buffer beams. Without lining, I think it'd look a little strange on the side, and probably stick out a bit too much. So he has a slightly larger one on his back buffer beam, and a super tiny one on his front. And that's how you're able to tell this is the number one engine. Besides the blue, of course. Now, getting into the canon I've made for this guy, the reason he is, well, the way he is, is because he's made to be the Hudswell and Clark 1800, just, well, an E2. And he resembles this engine quite closely, just with the timeline being brought forward a bit. Instead of being built in 1947 by Hudswell and Clark, this locomotive is built at Brighton in 1940, being the last E2 to ever be built. And because of that, he features some modifications, like his extended side tanks. The engine was made to strictly work the British Sugar Corporation, or BSC, and up until modernization would do just that, pulling beet from the farms up to the factories. Well, eventually dieselization works its way to the BSC, and Thomas, being a cheeky but smart engine, knows what this means for him, and at some point he makes his escape to the island of Sodor, showing up there quite randomly and then becoming their station pilot. So this model is made to represent pre-Sodor, I guess, as to why he's so bland and sad looking, I suppose. Like I said, this isn't very flushed out, it's not very, well, thought out either, I guess. A lot of that couldn't actually happen in real life. But there is something I've used to get around that, and it was said by the unlucky tug quite beautifully. I don't care. We're kind of talking about trains with faces right now. It doesn't really matter if it was going to happen in real life or not. It does, however, unfortunately make Thomas quite a bit older and make his arrival to the island of Sodor much later. But to that I say, number one, Thomas was never older than Gordon in the first place. That just doesn't work. Two, it's a bit more substance than he just showed up one day and the railway decided to keep him. And three, honestly it's just fun, and it's something I had a blast doing, and hope to shape that story behind him a little bit better in the coming weeks. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of my Thomas. Definitely not the most um, flushed out and in need of some revisions in some places, but that is the story I've currently got going for him and will work to develop a little bit more in the coming future. I plan to do this with all of the characters I can, you know, especially since Bachman is really stepping up that Thomas and Friends in scale range. So expect a Percy, hopefully a James, a Toby, uh, all of them at some point if uh, Bachman will let that happen. And this, ladies and gentlemen, has been the story of my little in scale alternate universe Thomas model. So with all that being said, thanks again for watching, guys, and hopefully I'll see you guys in the next one. There's that sound again. Is that the Railway Series purist coming to kill me? It probably is. It probably fucking is.
Either, either, either subscribe, donate, or get the fuck out. So, at the time of me recording this, the most recent video I've made is the one on Audrey's James and Edward models. And of course, as most videos do, it ended up inspiring me to make a model of my own, in Audrey's style of James. But I wasn't sure how I was going to do it. As you'll recall, Audrey had two James models. The first on a 260 Glasgow and Southwestern Railway locomotive, the Austrian Goods, designed by Peter Drummond, and the second being made by a Trying Johnson 3F in 060, which was converted into a 260. Well, I definitely didn't have a Peter Drummond kit laying around, and unfortunately didn't have a Trying 3F either. But I did have a Lima 4F, and have for a while in Engage, and while definitely not exact, it would be close enough for a Mark II James, at least in my eyes. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is how I converted my Lima 4F into an Audrey-styled James. So, let's start at the beginning. The first time this model ever showed up was actually in the second video I ever posted. And before being an Audrey-styled James was still a James, just unpainted wearing a sad face from a Tomica model. Ultimately, this was pretty boring, so I never really did much with the model. Fast forward to when I'm researching my newest video, and after the decision was made, I started work pretty quickly. The chassis was separated from the shell, and the shell was then primed. I was tempted to mask off the boiler and other parts I wanted to keep black, but with how small the body shell was, I figured this wouldn't work as well as I was hoping. So I decided to paint the entire thing red and would paint the black later. That being with Rust-Oleum, their gloss apple red color, which helps stick out from the normal Tamiya Italian red, and also to me matches the Audrey model pretty well. So soon the entire body shell and tinder were painted that. I gave this a couple hours to dry and then would move in with the black detailing, using several small brushes and apple barrel black, which is normally my go-to. I painted the front of the smoke box, the running plate, and the top of the tinder, doing my best to match the same spots Audrey had. Next would come his gold detailing, which was done with Tester's gold enamel, and after giving this several hours to dry, it was all sealed in with a coat of gloss clear, or Tamiya semi-gloss, as I still wanted James to be shiny, but still a little bit more on the realistic side. Being so small, it was inevitable that some paint would end up with some mishaps. So to hide this, I weathered him very lightly with some black weathering powder, mostly around the top of the smoke box, the roof, and his splasher area to cover up the imperfections in the running board. After that, I applied some LMS transfers, specifically his fives, and now all James needs is his lining. But there was still one thing I wanted to do, and that was to attempt extending his running plate or perhaps giving him a front bogey truck. However, personally, I'm not very good with Tamiya Putty, and every time I've tried to do such have pretty much failed miserably. So I decided to get crafty and came up with an idea. This model is likely to be used exclusively on Kato Compact Track, so adding a front bogey may mess with his performance anyway. So I figured why not add a false one? And the way I did that was by removing his front coupler, extending the area that sat in, and then putting a very small wheel set where that once was. Once it was applied, I painted it black to match the others, and currently it rides right above the rails, so it looks like it's making contact, but it's actually not, and has no effect on his performance as of now. It does look a little strange, especially without the extended running board, but honestly, I kind of like it. It's like a smaller version of Audrey's model, and since he'll be running on a compact layout anyway, it works for me. Now all James needs is his lining and a little bit more weathering, and with that, the tiny Audrey James will be completed. But for now, this is how he is. And I'm happy to say this model got to go on a small vacation with me and even got to meet the Flying Duchess in real life. So here's how that went and some running footage. If you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe for even more trained content. Huge shout out to my patrons for everything you guys do, and consider supporting me on Patreon if you want to see videos like this a little early, or even be featured in them as well. That aside though guys, thanks again for watching. And with all of that being said, hopefully I'll see you guys in the next one.
You know those kind of projects that you're fairly certain will take forever and definitely not be the easiest? In some capacity, almost every custom ends up being such. But what about a project with that started in mind? Something that would end up being a challenge for me to finish. Well, for that, ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to take a look at my custom Engage Lady. A project that even now needs a little bit of work. For example, right now she's missing a resistor, which will allow her to run on Kato track, which is 12 volts while the motor she runs on at the moment is 3 volts, resulting in the jumps and high speeds you see here, so expect updates on that pretty soon. Aesthetically, however, Lady is pretty much finished, so let's go ahead and jump into that. Ladies and gentlemen, this is how I made the smallest custom I've ever made. So, starting off, the body design is done by Broke Train Enthusiast. Originally, he had made Lady for 00 scale, but scaled her down for me. She was printed by Green's Trains, who was kind enough to send me two shells in case something went wrong with the first, and thank god he did. But thankfully, sanding was very much a minimal with these two, and very quickly I had both primed. I repeated the priming process a couple times over to make sure the models were as smooth as they could be, and once that had dried, propped both up on toothpicks to spray paint purple. Specifically, to me is TS-37, a lavender color. The black and gold paint were all done by hand, and honestly done pretty quickly. But it was here I ran into one of my first issues. I was working on both shells side by side, and went to reprime the second one. I wasn't paying attention to where I was spraying, however, and actually got the, well, finished shell with the primer, which ended up giving it a tusty look. Instead of getting mad at it, I decided this would be a workshop lady, and since the hand paint on it wasn't the cleanest anyway, I would try a little harder with the second one, and that's the lady you guys saw at the beginning, and will continue to see moving forward. I did my best to give lady as much detail as I could, but being so small this was gonna be pretty hard. She doesn't feature lining or anything like that, nor do I think she needs to. In my opinion, she looks fine without it, plus I'm not sure they even make lining that's that small, so it works for me. At the moment, Lady only has one face, which is her shocked face, and this was designed by Rexecutions and hand-painted by me with a toothpick, which was a first and hopefully a last. But with that completed, the body shells were pretty much done. Now would come the very difficult part, which would be motorizing one of these two or what I thought would be the most difficult part. Some of you guys may remember quite a bit ago when I made a double-O scale version of Lady, which essentially was an Ertl model that sat on a pug chassis. At least for me, in double-O scale, this was too small to power. So instead of her ever going on her own, she was a free roller, and often pushed by other engines or pulled by them. Honestly, it didn't really look the best, and I was worried the Engage Lady would be similar. It literally is the tiniest shell I had ever worked on. I didn't think I'd be able to stick a motor or any sort of chassis into it, honestly. It was at this point, however, I remembered a chassis I had used a long time ago. That being the 2 Copal 040 Super Mini Size chassis. Which definitely lives up to its name, but like I said before is only 3 volts, so it needs to be modified even more. But once I got my hands on a new one, it was pretty quickly installed into Lady. I painted the pistons on it the same purple as the body shell, and eventually would like to paint the wheels the same color, but haven't gotten around to doing it yet. The only downside to using this chassis besides the voltage was it meant I lost all of the cab detail, since Lady's entire bottom side had to be dremeled out to fit it, and the motor goes in right where that cab detail used to be. But truth be told, I'm really not that worried about it. The fact she's motorized means way more to me. Also, for fun and to kinda hide that, I added one of Reneas' packed tail lamps to the back of Lady. And once that and the chassis were fit, Lady was pretty much complete. I gave her a whistle from a Terrier locomotive that I cut down, and decided from this point forward I wouldn't do much else. For certain, I want to add a tiny Burnett stone in her cab, fix that resistor issue, but aesthetically, Lady is pretty much complete. Like I said, I don't plan on adding lining or anything like that. All I set out to do was make a tiny Lady model, the tiniest I could make. And honestly, I feel like I've done that. I even found a way to power her. So, instead of tripping on the smaller details and making sure she has every little thing, instead, I'd rather just be proud at the model I've managed to make. Since, if you ask me, it's a million times better than the 00 scale one. But, Lady aside, is also the smallest model I've ever managed to complete. Unfortunately, I can't get any proper running footage until that resistor is fitted onto her. So, whenever that's complete, I'll make an update video showcasing her on the move. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, this is how I made the smallest lady model possibly in the world. And hopefully you guys enjoyed learning about it just as much as I enjoyed making it. 
Really quick, I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to my patrons for making projects like this possible, and once again thank you guys for making it this far into the video. I can't apologize enough for not being able to have any running footage, but I promise you I'll have it as soon as I can. And it won't be the choppy mess which you've already seen. But like always guys, thanks again for watching. And if you enjoyed today's video, be sure to like and subscribe for even more trained content, or dislike it if you dislike the video, it's really up to you. And with all of that being said, hopefully I'll see you guys in the next one. Whenever I make a Thomas and Friends character, I normally have a dilemma. Do I make the character in my style, or do I make the character how it's supposed to be? And 9 times out of 10, my style beats out the latter. Really, I just find it more fun that way. And while I have infinite respect for railway series modelers or CGI modelers, TVS modelers, literally all of them, my personal preference is just kinda doing whatever, and finding whatever fits your needs or wants. I think the engine that personifies this the most is my Dean Goods James, which is probably my favorite custom to date, but also sorta led me down a rabbit hole. If James could be a Dean Goods, other characters could be anything, but who would I model next? After some quick planning, a quick trip to the hobby store, and a very lucky Hattons listing, I decided that would be Percy. Since one besides James, he's my favorite character, and two, the Peckett Percy I made a while ago just was a project I never ended up finishing. The Peckett itself just felt kinda too big for Percy, and as a whole it was something I felt I could do way better on. Then came the Pug, specifically the LNYR Pug. Now, this is a very old Hornby model, it has the oldest tooling I think you can get on a Pug. But one, it wasn't very expensive, and two, while old Hornby stuff is, well, pretty primitive, eight times out of ten, it'll withstand the test of time. So I rolled the dice and got mine. The idea to make Percy a pug is one I've had for a while, but ultimately was an idea I would side for the Peckett, since the Peckett was a basis I had at the time. More recently, I figured the pug would be a little bit more unique, and serve to make my style of Percy a little bit better. So very quickly, I had the entire model primed. Instead of using the Tamiya Gray Primer I normally do, this time I used their white primer, and did that in about two coats. After that came applying the Tamiya Park Green, which just like the primer encased the entire model. And since the idea of this Percy is a bit more of an industrial one, I decided against painting his wheels and pistons green, and instead once the green had dried went in with a lot of black detailing, for that using Apple Barrel Matte Black, a brush paint. Unfortunately my pug didn't come with a whistle, so instead I sourced one from a spare in-scale locomotive, and at right about this time I happened to get the capsule Percy that had the goggles. Now, the plan from the jump was to use a capsule face for this model, since they're very small and happen to fit pretty well, but my fiancé saw the face with the goggles and suggested I use that one instead. At first I wasn't sure, but I took the face off anyway and gave it a shot, and basically immediately fell in love with it. So really there's no reason behind the goggles besides they look cool? But if you think about it, what engine could use them more? Percy has been buried in coal, buried alive, fallen in the ocean, smashed into a lime cart, smashed into a luggage cart. Given his track record, maybe some goggles wouldn't be a bad idea, especially being in an industrial area, which basically is the style I'm going for. I decided to do some very minimal weathering before I would apply the decals, really to decide if I wanted to add his boiler stripes. The weathering ended up taking over, so I decided against that, but very quickly added the sixes to his cab. These are LMS 00 scale transfers I got from Hattons. I also added some small ones to his front and back buffer beams. That all was sealed in with a coat of matte clear, and with the encouragement of Sodor Rai Modeler, I decided to weather this model to hell and back. Since if my James is dirty, it's really not fair Percy's all bright and clean, is it? So very quickly this Percy became, well, put upon. Which, if you've seen my recent video on that episode, you know is my favorite episode anyway. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, my pug Percy was complete. And now that you know how I made him, why I made him, and a little bit more about my strange decisions in doing so, let's go ahead and see him in action. Oi, bro. Oh, I have it on off. Motherfucker. Also, quick note because I forgot to mention it. I did try out some normal buffers on the pug, but honestly felt they were a little too long and didn't look right, and also constantly interlocked with the wagons I would make him pull. So I decided to go with the block buffers you see him with now. And that's also why he pulls this freight train so gracefully. Just figured I'd throw that out there in case somebody was wondering. No rims in sight, I just keep the fundamental Rhymes in my pencil 
I know it's hard to put your heart in what you went to when she got a kill body and hours she a rider. Huh? With the world on the shoulders, looking at the future house, daughter in the motor. Won't let them get over But I forgive him for the game that he told us But I just wish that motherfucker would just grow up He fit to something, can't afford a box of donuts And my flow is kicking something I just pass and I throw up My nigga wear a mask and you know what That nigga here blast and you know what Back to the future or the past I ask And I'm just happy but that path don't last Sometimes I look back Lab unhand two strokes and she still kept hope and so I keep hope and keep focus Hands on the bar cause life's a roller coaster Even in death, life is never over Legacy turns a fall around in the seven seas But I'm looking for something that's more heavenly And when I die I'm taking music, you in death for me <laughs> I'll just smoke them And I'll roll them out Really quick, I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to my patrons. Since videos and projects like this wouldn't be possible without their help, if you want to support the channel more or see videos like this early, I recommend checking that out. And if you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe for even more trained content. There's always more stuff on the way. And if you couldn't tell already, this small collection I've started is definitely going to start growing. I'm still trying to decide on what'll be next, or I guess who will be next, but either way, I promise it won't be too long until you guys find out. These projects have been some of my favorite in a long time, and I know at the beginning of this video I said the Dean Goods James was my favorite, but he may have to move over a spot. I'm not saying he's not my favorite, but just like in real life, with the actual characters, I think both of these two will have to serve as my favorite, just like how James and Percy serve as my favorite Thomas characters. So really it only feels right that these two are the first completed in this collection anyway. But with that being said, hopefully you guys enjoyed this next installment and such, and as always, guys, thanks again for watching, and hopefully I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank God, that Percy Custom's finally done. Now I can work on other stuff, like this. Oh wait, what? Some of you guys may remember when I made that super tiny in-scale lady, and that was torturous. Don't get me wrong, I love in-scale, but when you're used to things like double-O scale or maybe G or G1, painting things that are so small can be intimidating. That being said though, I did like the challenge. So to go alongside lady, I decided to make another small engine, though ultimately was undecided on who or what it would be. I did some looking on Shapeways and ended up finding a very Percy-like shell. Well, I guess I have the paint already. And after finding that, link in the description by the way, I decided I'd make a super tiny Percy model. It didn't even recommend a chassis since this thing is so small. So a challenge I was in for indeed. If you recall to my lady video, to power her I used a two copal chassis, which fair warning are pretty complicated to use. These are made for about four to six volts. And Kato Tomic's most in-scale ranges do 12 volts. Even with resistors and weight added, it really didn't function well and if I wasn't careful stood the chance of burning out. Despite that, I bought another for Percy, but stripped it of its motor completely, leaving the chassis itself a free roller. This will come into play a little bit later. Thankfully, the shell arrived pretty quickly, and I test fit that chassis as soon as it did. Admittedly, it is a bit small, honestly to a pit of a ridiculous degree, but I already spent 40 bucks on this and didn't want to buy another, so we're gonna run with it. And with that motor stripped, the original housing fits in the boiler perfectly. I gave the model a very light sanding, and immediately after cleaning it, put on my first coat of primer. One, to see if I missed any spots, which of course I did, and two, because I can't wait for anything, and really wanted to see this project through. So a little more sanding later, maybe two or three more coats of primer, and soon after, a Tamiya Park Green was applied as well. This is the same green I used for the Pug Percy.
and following in those footsteps, immediately applied some apple barrel matte black to his foot plate and smoke box. Once that was done, I sealed it all in with a coat of matte clear, and then would mask off the body to spray paint the buffer beams. I did the side with a red paint pin, and pretty soon after was test fitting faces and sixes. I had a couple spare faces from my AU Thomas, and believe it or not, they fit on Percy pretty well. So I took one of these and blue tacked it to his front. It may kind of look like Thomas, but at this scale it's hard to tell, so it is what it is. I could also call that Railway Series, so meh. And immediately after that, applied some very small LMS 6s to his coal bunker. All of this was sealed in with matte clear, and it was here I decided I would do the impossible. Line his boiler. I know, that's not something I often do. And the way I went about doing this was custom cutting vinyl, or strips of red vinyl which took literally forever. It was a pain to get the right size, and even now they feel a bit big. But eventually, I think at like 3am, I decided I'd cut my losses, and was satisfied with this. So I sealed those in, left him to dry, and the next day started with weathering. I prefer my Percy's to look put upon, so a lot of coal powder and rust powder were applied in different spots. I also applied some very small coal into his bunker at this time. I completely forgot about that. And pretty soon after would add the gold, weather that as well, and sourced a very small whistle. Or it doesn't look small on him, but it, trust me it is. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the completion of Percy. Until I dropped him, and had to reattach his cab ladder, and his funnel, and a buffer. But thankfully, I repaired all of this pretty easily. So much so that he came with me on my engagement. I told my fiancé it was Percy in my pocket when it was actually a ring box. Big brain move. But this still leaves one problem. Percy is unpowered. He may look nice, but he doesn't actually go. Slow down, hold your horses, I figured that out too. Thankfully, I had a spare 11109 Kato chassis, which is basically a very chibi, small chassis. And for a little bit, this would pull Percy, since at the moment he only has a front coupler. This didn't look too convincing though. So to go on top of it, I took a Tomix Annie, cut it down to size, repainted it, weathered it, added windows, and turned it into a orange workman's coach. So instead of Percy being pulled around by a random chassis, it looks like he's shunting, which I think is better than the first. The process for this was very simple. Cut down, sand down, glue, reprime, spray, pretty standard stuff. But if you guys would like a more in-depth look, be sure to let me know. And I'll make a separate smaller video on that as well. But that, ladies and gentlemen, completed Percy the small engine. Very, very small engine. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of this one. To have figured out lining, applied things like sixes, and actually have a sort of railway series looking, more unique in-scale Percy is just pretty crazy. It's not something I ever expected to see, let alone make. So hopefully you guys enjoy figuring out how I did it. And now that I've done all this talking, and probably bored you to death, let's go ahead and see this guy in action. If you want to see videos like this early, be sure to check out my Patreon. Huge shout out to my supporters. And as always, guys, thanks again for watching. Subscribe if you want to see more, and hopefully I'll catch you guys in the next one. You know, this is oddly familiar. Most fans of Thomas and Friends remember the episode where Thomas went faced first through a station master's house. It's one of those stories that's inarguably a classic, and I've made customs based on it before. That first time was in G-Scale, but today I thought it'd be fun to challenge myself and try something a little bit smaller. And if you've seen my recent videos or read the title of this, you may know exactly what we're using. Today we'll be using a Capsule Playrail Thomas. And using some spare parts I found around my desk, today we'll hopefully make this guy look guilty of property damage.
So let's go ahead and jump into it. Now, when making a custom of Thomas Comes to Breakfast, you have a few options. You could follow the television series and add bits of plaster, wood, and a bush to his front end, or the railway series, which features all of that plus a window frame around his smoke box. Or you could be like me and say forget both of those and use the superior inspiration of the wooden railway version. Jokes aside, this is probably my favorite piece of Wooden Railway merch ever, and I actually got it at a day out with Thomas as a kid. And since that day, it has remained firmly in my top 5 merch list of all time across all brands. But, you see, it was kind of a one-time thing, they literally never made another version of this in any form. If you have ADHD though, and a will, arguably anything's possible, so here's how I made my own. Now, in this situation, I don't think Thomas would be smiling. So, we're just gonna get rid of it, and instead put on a tired face taken from a paint-splattered Thomas. When I made this in G-Scale, the biggest thing I didn't like about it was its smile, so we're gonna make sure we don't do that again with this model. It also just kinda suits the project, he looks embarrassed almost. Now, if you have a keen eye, you may have noticed that this Capsule Thomas is a little different. He doesn't feature a normal buffer beam sticker, and that's because I unfortunately got him without one. I gave him new buffers using pupil vinyl decals, but unfortunately never cracked a new coupler. So for a while this Thomas sat in the extra pile, but as you'll soon see, ended up perfect for this project. And now that we have Thomas here prepped and ready, let's get into what else we need. Simple, but hopefully effective. So the first bit we'll start with is the face, and for the face I want to use some inspiration from the wooden railway model. On that model, Thomas has some eggs on his cheek from the breakfast he ruined, and I'm going to attempt to put those on this very small face. This hopefully will be an easy process, and will be done with a white paint pen and a yellow paint pen. You know, that's a lot better than I expected. And using a little bit of black tack, we stick that right back on the front of Thomas, and at least that part is now complete. There's far more to a Thomas Comes to Breakfast custom than a face, however. So with that out of the way, we move on to our extra bits. For this project, pretty luckily, I found a broken window seal and had a bunch of clump foliage spare. Since I'm working with a capsule, I grabbed the smallest pieces I could find and was kinda stumped with the window seal for a bit at first. At first I figured I would put this part around Thomas's funnel, but this was something I really didn't like the look of. So instead I would take a little bit more inspiration from the wooden model and put it around Thomas's smoke box almost like it's a little hat. And now that our little window samurai has some proper gear, we'll also refit his face. And now ladies and gentlemen, we get into the fun part. Now, to fix that lack of a front coupler and add a little bit of detail to the front end of Thomas, we're gonna need our tester's glue. Really, any glue works, this just doesn't leave a nasty residue. And I'm gonna make sure to dab it where that coupler should be, as well as anywhere I want the clump foliage to stick, so also the front running board. You really don't have to overdo it, a single glob spread out wherever you want it to go will do the trick. And with that complete, just add a bit of clump foliage. I think it's safe to say this guy is finally taking shape. Next, I did something I think more Thomas fans should do and went outside, where I happened to find some very small twigs, and I figured these would look good on the front of Thomas as well. First, we have to break them down and make them a bit smaller though. Once that's complete, we do the same thing we did with the clump foliage. Add a little bit of glue and just stick it wherever you think it looks best. And at 
this point, ladies and gentlemen, it's really up to you if you want to continue. I had everything I needed to call this a complete custom, but still wanted to add a little bit more. I decided to go around Thomas with a little bit more glue and a little bit more clump foliage, and just add any detail I thought he was missing. So that's what you're seeing right now. And now, with all of that done, ladies and gentlemen, we are on to the glamour shots. As always, huge thank you and shout out to my patrons for making videos like this even possible. If you want to join these beautiful people on screen or see videos or projects early, be sure to check that out in the description. And of course, thank you guys again for watching. This is the kind of custom anybody could make, so hopefully it inspired you to do something today. If I can do this, literally anyone can, so if you're interested, be sure to give it a shot. And if you want to see more videos like this, be sure to like and subscribe, since there's always more on the way. This video was a blast to make and a blast to film, so I'd love to make more if you guys are interested. But I think for now, I've done enough talking. I'm gonna let the work speak for itself. As always, guys, thanks again for watching, and hopefully I'll see you guys in the next one. Dinner fast yourself, Thomas. We'll soon have you back on the rails. They laughed. Boy said he wanted to get his junk now and jiggle a snack. I paid it and I fought with my nut on seas. Babe boy said, said, jiggle line my jiggle you, bitle you until I sleep with snack weapons. Pong nella you snacks. You want to see that alcohol? If you were to ask me what would happen if you took Thomas, right? N not this Thomas, the superior J50 Thomas. If you were to take that and mix it with, say, a Hudswell Clark design, for simplicity's sake, we'll say 1334, and shrunk that down to a shunter sized locomotive, what would you get? I'd probably first say, are you okay? What what made you think that? Do you, do, do you need a hug? And then I'd say you're surprisingly in luck, since I recently asked that same question. What would happen if you took a J50, shrunk it down, and put it on an 040 chassis with pistons? Well, from experience, you get an interesting product, and believe it or not, that's not how it was supposed to go. This was a locomotive built on a lot of what if, so with all of that being said, Ladies and gentlemen, get comfortable, and let me explain to you how I brought the Curse of Crovens Gate to life. No, but really, are you sure? Do you do you need anything? Like, maybe some water? Just, just anything I can do to help. Just let me know. This all began with me wanting to make a J50 variant of Thomas, or really anything closer to Audrey's original model, or drawings of the same variety. Just something different from an E2. Though, just like E2s, in real life, J50s are massive locomotives. They are not the small tank engine we normally think of when we think of Thomas. At this point, I thought I was pretty much stuck, since most J50 prints are pretty large. And I wanted my model to actually fit the profile of a small tank engine. Luckily for me, however, Crafty Modeler actually happened to have a J50 locomotive on Thingiverse. I downloaded the model, literally squished it down to a smaller size, and sent it off to Shapeways to be printed. For those interested, he's also gone back and made a smaller variant for public use as well. Unfortunately, at the time, it was not around though, so I had to do this part myself. Pretty quickly, Thomas was printed in a high-quality plastic, and the plan I had at first was to take a Bachman Inscale Thomas and use that chassis for this model. Unfortunately, this didn't really fit like I hoped it would. But what surprisingly did was a Bachman Inscale Percy. With a tad bit of modification to the footplate, it was a surprisingly flush fit. Though not a very accurate one, since no J50s ever had pistons or an 040 configuration. So it was then I had another idea. If I'm gonna be inaccurate, I might as well go all the way. So to justify the pistons and the design I ended up finding, I also took some inspiration from the Hudswell and Clark locomotive number 1334, another small tank engine that looks kinda like a J50, but is definitely not. It also doesn't have an 040 configuration, but it does have the pistons and industrial look I was going for. 
You know, I totally could have just said Hudswell and Clark 1800, which was made into Thomas and also has pistons, but I really made this complicated, didn't I? And after that decision was made, the painting of the model started pretty quickly. Both the footplate and body were sanded extensively, primed in a Tamiya light gray, with the body and pistons then being sprayed a dark blue, specifically Tamiya TS-15. His buffers were salvaged from the leftover Percy, the chassis left, and once that all dried, the running plate was sprayed with a Rust-Oleum gloss red. The top of the foot plate, smoke box, and coal bunker were all hand painted with apple barrel black. I would also salvage a lamp, lamp irons, and hook from the Bachman Percy as well. Without a doubt, the hardest part of this model was his handrails. Each one is custom cut from extra bits of plastic, and then glued where they need to go. This process took the better part of two hours, and honestly is still the easiest way you can go about doing it. Once they all were applied and painted, however, it was definitely all worth it. Excuse my busted finger, but the back of Thomas is a bit of an enigma. At the top he has a small Bachman in-scale Percy lamp. The lamp hooks on the bottom, however, come from a DePole 00 gauge B4. Definitely a bit oversized, but a welcome detail nonetheless. At this point, I painted his wheels black, gave him a single small safety valve, painted that and the top of his funnel gold, applied some small LMS ones to his front buffer beam and the side of his body, and since at this point Thomas was pretty much already cluttered with detail, I decided to only line his boiler stripes. Just like the Percy I just made, this was done by hand with final and was also a headache. As such, they're not the most even, but even still, I think they tie the model together pretty well. Lastly came adding the coal and bits of coal weathering, and with that, Thomas was pretty much done. Honestly, for a while, I was back and forth on actually lining his sides, but opted not to for simplicity's sake. I really don't want to add too much clutter to the model, and already achieved what I set out to do. To make one, very fucking unique, Thomas model. Or, as I like to call him, the Curse of Crovin's Gate. And hopefully you guys have enjoyed figuring out how he came to be. Now, with all of that being said, like and subscribe, just like and subscribe, do it, like and subscribe, like the video, subscribe, help me in the YouTube app, just to please this one time, come on bro, come on bro. Now, jokes aside, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video, huge shout out to my patrons on screen for making videos like this possible, and with all of that being said, let's finally see this dude in action. <laughs> To do, honestly, honestly, I don't, honestly, know. I don't it know. It feels, feels kind of wrong, wrong to mess, to mess with, with this much detail. detail. What, I what I do know is my 009 collection, collection has, has never been, been so stylish. stylish. And if this, and if says, this says anything, anything for, what's for what's to come, to come I'm excited. <laughs> so, maybe I lied. I know I said I wasn't sure if I was going to do this or not, but today we'll be turning the Peko Small England Princess model into Duke. So, for starters, I basically dismantled the entire thing. Typically, you don't want the chassis present in any sort of painting situation. So that was removed from the locomotive and tinder portion, and very quickly after, it was all primed. For this, I used a Tamiya light gray super fine primer, which thankfully covered up the princess detailing with a tad bit of sanding. I let that dry for a bit, and then came back and sprayed the entire thing a darker brown. Now, I know dark brown isn't the most accurate to Duke, though thankfully at this point, I decided that wasn't really the goal. Instead, I'd base it off of a mid-Sodor render made by Rexecutions, albeit a tad loosely, more in my style. So, as you can see, I left the majority of the smaller detailing on the parts, like the extra coal I added in the tinder, or the handrails on the boiler. I also replaced the smoke box door with an Ertl Duke face at this time too. But other details such as the whistles or brake pipes are not something I'm too keen on trying to paint over, so those were removed. 
and each will be detailed away from the main body. Assembly aside, we have our essentials, the Apple Barrel Matte Black, a not-so-fresh bottle of Tester's Metallic Gold, and a new set of paintbrushes to inevitably ruin. But thankfully, everything went pretty well according to plan. Pretty soon after I had the coal and inside of the tinder detailed, the top of his cab painted, the grab irons on both painted gold, and the boiler detailed and painted soon too, mainly using the gold to make Duke a little bit different. Though, because I'm a creature of habit, of course he gets a gold-tipped funnel. I also realized he has quite a bit of cab detailing, none of which is actually detailed, so using a white paint pen and a red paint pen we're going to fix that. So you'll never know how much I love you And I've gotta close up all the hubba hubba like a clam If you ever found out all the dreams that I am dreaming of you You would think that I'm a wolf And it's not I'm such a wolf It's just you're such a lamb and with that, we have two little gauges and a lever that nobody will likely ever see, but I know it's there, so it counts. Next came the reassembly of Duke, which I could have held off on, but I really wanted to see what he would look like. Inevitably, I'm going to take him apart to detail other things later, but um, leaving him in pieces wouldn't suit his grace very much, would it? And soon, Duke was reassembled and looking honestly better than I thought he would. So, of course, the only natural thing to do would be keep going. So, for a little bit, I turned gears back and focused on the cab again. I figured if he has a little bit of detail, why not give him a lot of detail, and I gave him some spare gauges I got from a 3D print. All three were hand-painted, and this took way too long, but, um, paid off in the end, I guess. I would also decide to have a little bit of fun and paint the inside of his cab a mint green. Really, just for the offset of color, and also because I really like chocolate mint. It kind of works out. And naturally next came lining, which was done with automotive pinstripe tape. This time a black in a 1 64th size, so pretty small stuff. I would also paint the front of his brake pipes red and add a lot of the small detail back onto him. The handrail at the top is not permanent, that was kind of just a test thing that I didn't end up liking in the end. And after that came my favorite part, the weathering process. Now for this I followed the TV series a bit, but also took a few creative liberties. And using that black powder would try to focus it in certain areas, like the corners of the boiler or the top of the tinder. I really like the brown I chose for Duke, so I don't want to compromise it too much, but also want it to be very clear he is a hard-working little engine. And as soon as that's all sealed in with matte clear, he also gets a small conductor, a double low scaled figure to sit in the cab. This is a bit of a spoiler, but I plan to make my 009 or mid-sodor engines in a preservation type era. So after I added his tail lamp, I also added a large M and S on either side. These were done with LMS water slide decals, and I imagine Duke wears them with a lot of pride. I sealed those in with a coat of matte clear and then weathered the body just a tad more. I also realized at this point I didn't fit his front grab irons and had basically lost them. So I crafted my own using the inside detailing of a Depole B4, painted that gold and applied them where you see. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we had turned our princess into a duke, so let's move on to the glamour shots. Really quick, as always, I want to give a huge shout out to my patrons for making videos and projects like this possible. If you want to see early videos or model reveals, be sure to check that out in the description. And hopefully you guys have enjoyed figuring out how I made my princess model into my new duke model. Now, technically Duke isn't completely complete, he still needs nameplates, as I'm sure you can tell, and have already commented. Those sadly are being made from brass and are in the mail, so they'll likely be a while. Those aside though, Duke is pretty much done. And I also totally forgot to mention, I blacked out his uh, front and pack windows just for a... Uh, well, I'm gonna call it TVS accuracy, but I really accidentally painted some of them green, so um... It, it, it works out, thank you uh, David Mitten. And now that we've seen the Duke in all of his glory, let's go ahead and see him in action. If you guys enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe for even more train content. And with all of that being said, hopefully I'll see you guys in the next one. Long, long ago, 
Remember my custom Midlander, the really basic rusty repaint? The future was not very kind to her, and I feel like everybody has one of those drawers where you throw stuff you don't think you're gonna need. She kind of found herself in one of those. And since I've been going back to modeling 009 narrow gauge, I've been wanting to make a rusty to go beside Duke, with the initial plan being to either buy a whole new rusty or a new shell from Shapeways. Well, it just so happened around this time I was also in that drawer and found Midlander. She was pretty banged up though, she was missing buffers, her coupling hooks, and didn't have a cab. The one you see here actually comes from a whole other Rusty. Plus, from just being in the drawer itself, she naturally received a few dents to the body. Surprisingly, nothing too serious though, and I found new coupling hooks from a spare 3D print. The new buffers would come from a spare Bachman model, while the back ones came from a spare Tomix wagon, and the new cab was already modified, it had its windows cut out. At this point, with some sanding, it was looking like I could salvage the entire thing. So pretty quickly, I did just that and applied a new coat of primer. It turned out Midlander wasn't as banged up as I thought she was. The only damage I could really find was at the front end, and the face would be covering this anyway. At this point, I left it overnight to dry, and the next morning started on the orange paintwork. For Rusty's color, I chose Tamiya PS62, a pure orange. And after applying this in 2-3 to three coats, found the chassis to clean that, as well as two LMS number 5s to put on later. At this point, I would move on with hand painting though, using my Apple Barrel Matte Black. I painted Rusty's front, his footplate, and the top of the cab, as well as the bottom of the body and the inside of the cab. His back lamp was done with a Apple Barrel Matte White, and for the buffer beams would mask off the entire body except those, reprime them, and then respray them a Rust-Oleum Gloss Red. Now comes my favorite part of any custom, weathering. In favor of an industrial look, I planned not to line him, so I jumped to this pretty quickly using my black stardust, so starting off slow would apply some to his vents. I also forgot to mention I gave Rusty a fuel cap since it always bothered me this model never had one, and that was done using a N-scale buffer head. The weathering started slow at first, but very quickly overtook the entire model. To be a little different, I put the fives on the side of his cab at this point, and also decided I would get him some brass nameplates like I did for Duke, so... You've probably already commented I forgot that, but chokes on you? I didn't. And after applying some spare bits of plastic to the inside of the windows, all Rusty needed were those nameplates and a face. Now, since my favorite Rusty episode is Rusty in the Boulder, I decided he would wear a shocked face. And this was designed by Rexecutions and printed by Trainstorm1225. On the chance I messed one up, thankfully he sent me two, and I started with sanding those down just a tad bit and then priming them in a light gray. For his actual face color, I used a Rust-Oleum chalky gray, and then added his eyeballs using hand paints. Using the same black I used for his body, I hand painted the pupils and the inside of his mouth, and an ultra-thin sharpie covered his eyebrows. Last but not least was to seal the entire thing with matte clear and refit the chassis. And with that, not only did I save Midlander, but had a brand new Rusty model. Well, maybe not brand new, in some areas it definitely shows this is a uh, revival project. And just like with Duke, they won't be completely complete until they have those nameplates. I may add some small parts here and there with time, but this largely wraps up the Rusty model. And if nothing else, ladies and gentlemen, I hope this video inspired you to save those model scraps. One day they may come in handy and save your ass. Let this be proof. And now that you know how I made them, let's go ahead and see them in action. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe for even more train content. 
And as always, guys, thanks again for watching. And hopefully I'll see you guys in the next one. You know, like it or not, the hit era did have a somewhat consistent formula. You can notice it with almost every character they introduce. Very complex and hard to build models, characters that have a lot of potential, and they only use them once or twice. Fearless Freddy, Flora, Mighty Mac, Proteus, Stanley, Neville, Dennis, Hector, Molly. Actually, hold that thought, hold the last one. Now, before we get into my model of Molly, I think it's important we establish what Molly actually is. My model isn't meant to be an exact replica. I'm very much on the side of have your own ideas and let them take you where they take you. But I'm also a believer in get your facts straight and then distort them at your own leisure. So really quick, let me explain what Molly actually is. Molly is a Great Eastern Railway D-56 class, or an LNER D-15. Her original livery was a yellow and gold with red and gold lining, as well as yellow wheels with white rims. Altogether, a pretty complex prop, one that definitely took more than a few days to make, which again is kinda sad when you think about how little they used it. Molly would first appear in 2005, in Thomas's Milkshake Muddle, with her last appearance being a cameo in The Great Discovery, not even a talking part. And truth be told, don't take this the wrong way, I really enjoy Molly, she just isn't really anything as a character besides anxious. Almost every one of her stories involve her being embarrassed about something, feeling some sort of way that normally isn't happy, and to me it seemed like there was a lot of potential in this would-be character. I say would-be because, again, she was reduced to background appearances. Despite that, though, I always loved her livery, I loved the idea of her as a character, and I knew one day I would make a model of her but little did I know how complex that would actually be. We live in the age of 3D printing. It's one of my favorite parts of modeling trains currently. So the initial plan was to find a D15 print and just turn that into Molly. Sadly though, there wasn't a whole lot to find. It seems the D15 is a bit of a niche class. And even if I did get the body, would immediately have to butcher another engine for its chassis. Yeah, this wasn't gonna be an easy project to do. At least if I followed the hit era basis. If you saw my recent model update video, you may know I did not do that. So last Christmas, my grandfather gifted me with an H1. He knew this was a model I would one day modify and chokingly would call it Gordon because of that. Some of you guys may recognize this model since it was Gordon for a little bit. Admittedly, when he chokingly called it Gordon, it planted the seed in my head for it to actually be Gordon. But when I actually did it and took the time to look at it, it didn't have that Gordon feel, and admittedly didn't make the most sense for the character Gordon is. Well, for some reason after watching this, I decided to watch The Great Discovery. And who else did I catch in the background besides Molly? And then looking at her, looking back at the H1, I decided to make a different decision. And with all of that out of the way, let's jump into her build process. 
So to save her from being Gordon, the only thing I really had to do was get rid of the fours I had put on him. Once I had those taken off, she very quickly was primed with a Tamiya light gray. I specifically chose this lighter color since the colors going onto her would be more bright. And following that came Tamiya TS-34, a sort of toned down yellow. And that was applied to the entire body and tinder. Left over from Gordon, the original chassis had been painted black. And while part of me wanted to paint her wheels yellow, I also didn't want to risk messing up the entire chassis. So instead I opted to leave her wheels black and went in with more black detailing. Things like the cab roof, the foot plate, the smoke box, and this was done with apple barrel matte black. Like I mentioned in the update video, lining is something I'm kind of 50-50 on. Again, I did grow up in America, so this is a little different. But any steam engine I saw growing up didn't have lining. I feel like it's a lot to do that can ultimately end up taking away from a custom. In this case, I decided just not to. And instead, she would have a more industrial look. Which kinda ties into my personal idea for her, but we'll get into that later. If I wasn't gonna line her, she would need something else to make her a bit more identifiable. So I decided to throw on her weathering a bit heavier than I typically would. This was done with a mix of black weathering powder, brown panel line accent, and eventually an airbrush, but again we get to that later. Sadly for a few days Molly would stay in this state. This while I tried to figure out a face situation. Now at first for the life of me, I could not find a Molly face. Personally, I think the Trackmaster is hideous, and would rather have something with positionable eyes anyway. Sadly, and I hate this just as much as some of you guys will, the original plan was to use a Rebecca face and hopefully modify it to look like Molly. With major help from my friend Trainstorm, he prepped two Rebecca faces and sent them my way. Just before I painted these, however, Train Dude 456 and Thomas Modeler 1 entered the chat and basically said, no, you don't have to ruin your model, take this. And pretty soon after, this model was blessed, to say the least, with one of Thomas Modeler's classic series Molly faces. Now, I know some people like Molly's larger face more than her smaller one. Personally, I don't really care either way. I think they both scream Tim Burton for some reason. But on the chance I ever want her to wear the larger face, my good friend Project Northwestern sent me two. One that's quite a bit fatter and the other you'll see on the actual model. The larger one sadly requires pupils, which I don't have at the moment. But the moment I do get some, I promise you'll see this face on this model too. Her eyebrows were done with a painter's pen, and her mouth filled in with apple barrel matte white. With the boiler and body being so dirty, it really didn't make sense that she had a pretty pristine black chassis. Now we talk about that airbrush bit. I decided to mix a darker, almost rust brown working its way up from the chassis to the body. In a gradient-like way, it's pretty heavy on the wheels and dies off on the step ladders. And I feel like that also helped bring things full circle. It just didn't make a lot of sense having some of her so dirty and another part so clean. And with all of that done, the only thing left was smaller details. Now, Molly does have a pretty big oil lamp. This is one of many made by Westcliff Works that looks phenomenal in 00 scale. And to kind of match the size of it, I shortened up her other lamp iron. Instead of keeping the Mach 3 links, I decided to actually give her real ones. So if she ever wants to pull a 3 link consist, she now can. And a little bit of bronze was added on the safety valve and funnel and then weathered over as well. Thankfully, with all of that done, all she needed was a coat of matte clear. Now, we know how I made this molly, why I made this molly. What is this molly? Or what do I classify it as? I really don't know, it has an industrial feel to it, but that's not what I meant to do necessarily. It's just my take on Molly, that's what I'll call it. Molly from an alternate universe. And what exactly will she do? Well, kinda like I said, in my canon, since she kinda showed up and then disappeared, to me that means she was put on a certain part of the island we don't see. One of my favorite places is the coal mines. I realize putting an Atlantic on the branch line doesn't make much sense, so maybe that branch line was rebuilt to accommodate her, maybe she works at a larger mine instead, but the general idea is she pulls coal trains in the background. She's not like James, she doesn't need the praise for the work she does. She kinda just does it and is happy to know that she's helping in some sort of way. But that said, she doesn't mind the occasional praise, and a little acknowledgement never hurts. It's more than the show ever did for her. And with that complete, we can finally get into test running.
if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe for even more train content. There's always more stuff or customs on the way. And really quick, as always, I'd like to give a huge shout out to my patrons over on Patreon. If you want to see projects or videos early, or even get a shout out at the end of videos, be sure to check that out in the description. And I guess with all of that being said, thanks again for watching guys, and hopefully I'll see you guys in the next one. An exciting new arrival was an engine Cranky the Crane was unloading. It was heavy. This makes my chain ache, groaned Cranky. This is Harvey, the crane engine, Sir Topham Hatt said proudly. The other engines thought Harvey looked strange. You know what there isn't enough of in any scale of modeling? Crane engines. Like, look at the dube's crane tank. This thing is awesome. How has no company made a model of this yet? It puts people like me in a awkward situation. Mainly because I love Harvey. He's a favorite in the Thomas and Friends roster of characters. And for the longest time, I wanted to make a model of him, but didn't know how. The original and obvious idea was design one and print it. But being that this was such a complicated design, and I have little to no experience in doing such, that was not going to be easy. I figured my only options would be buying a Trackmaster and putting a pug chassis in it. That is, until I looked at L&J's toy shop. It just so happened they had a Harvey for sale, a Nakayoshi one. And in terms of all of the Harvey toys ever made, this one is probably the most accurate. It has a pretty good size, accurate proportions. Pretty quickly, I decided to order that and decided I would try to modify the toy to be a 00 scale runner. Really quick, this is not sponsored, but I want to give a huge shout out to LNJ Toys again. The Nakayoshi Harvey is a pretty hard model to find, and they sold it to me for $30. They always have super killer deals. If you ever need a Thomas anything, I highly recommend checking out their shop. Personally, I've always gotten the best service. And in no time, Harvey arrived to me. He even came with a little friend. This is a pocket fantasy Harvey, and my first uh, pocket fantasy ever. It just might start a new addiction. But immediately at this point, I got to work on his big brother. The first step was naturally remove his decaling, orb stickers, anything he had on him that would mess up the priming process. I removed his name with rubbing alcohol, got rid of the stickers on the back of the cab and on the top of the crane, and before I went to prime him, realized this entire thing kind of went together like a kit. You could take off basically every part, every gear, the crane itself, the boiler, the smoke box, and this was going to very seriously help the painting process. But I also realized one other problem before I started. The Nakayoshi Harvey model does not have windows, or real ones. Well, in this case, I did end up getting a bit lucky. The windows on the dupes crane tank are very simple. It's kind of like the entire front of the cab is open. So that's pretty much what I did on my model. I decided to dremel out that middle wall and sanded it to a smooth finish. Admittedly, this entire process was pretty nerve-wracking, so I only did it on the front. Sadly, my Harvey model does not have rear windows, but having the front open was enough for me. I then took him apart and primed each part separately. Now, at this point, I decided Harvey would not have his normal livery. As you probably could tell, I'm a huge fan of the tube's crane tank. I think it's an awesome locomotive and personally have always liked its very simple, industrial-feeling livery, so I decided I would do that on my model too. But also keep it Harvey, so maybe this is Harvey before he came to Sodor. Honestly, it's just cool, I'm not thinking about it that hard. And painted his boiler a Tamiya Park Green. I did the same to the crane, also adding the matte black on the front, and before I primed the footplate, decided to fit the chassis. Now, the chassis you see under Harvey is a heavily cut-down B4 chassis. This honestly is not something I can recommend doing. It was very scary and a nerve-wracking experience. I'm not the first to say it, DePole has a very shit quality control, and this is the same chassis I used on Raf Duncan. It has always had problems and kinda always sucked. Cutting through it with a Dremel did not help that factor. I basically had to remove the entire firebox glimmer, as well as about 80% of the front before the pistons. Again, this was very nerve-wracking, but once it was done, it was a flush fit. Unfortunately, the smoke box in front of the boiler did have some interference, so those had to be dremeled out as well. But pretty quickly, it was all coming together and the footplate was primed too. I decided to paint the entire footplate and back of the cab a matte black. Gave that several hours to dry and then masked off the sides and top. Then repriming the buffer beams and spraying those a camel yellow, also made by Tamiya. 
His buffers and step ladders were also separate pieces, so those were removed and painted a matte black as well. And pretty quickly, Harvey was coming back together. I have to say, the hardest part was probably lining up the pistons and the smoke box. Like I said, the smoke box and front of the boiler do have quite a bit of interference with the chassis. That said, I was not going to have the motor protruding through the body, so a lot of modification had to be done to make that a flush thing. Eventually, however, it was done, and when I went to give Harvey his test run, he did not move, and that was, that was very disheartening, not gonna lie. It turned out in the process of reassembly, I damaged the board inside of the chassis. Who would have guessed? So I did what I should have done a long time ago and removed that complicated piece of shit. Now all of the wiring is connected directly to the motor and to the pickups. And you know what? Admittedly, it runs quite a bit better after that. And ladies and gentlemen, I called it at that point. The only thing he needed now was a front coupler. And the one you see now is a Mach 1, made from an old Hornby Pug and a spare detail kit from one of my Atlantics. Like I said, this is more a mock coupler. I don't ever plan to have Harvey pulling things from the front or maybe even the back, but if that ever changes, I'll let you guys know. Now all Harvey needs is to be weathered. And while I sadly haven't gotten to that part yet, I still wanted to show off where I am with this model and hopefully get you guys just as excited as I am for his future. This was definitely a scary model to make, but ended up being one of my favorites I've ever done. For a long time, I thought Harvey was a model I would never make just because it'd be so complicated. And I'm happy to say, at that point, I was just being stupid. Let this go to show you, you can make any Thomas and Friends character or any model project you want if you just put your mind to it. It sadly wasn't the easiest, but either way, it got done. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of the results. Before I ruin this beautiful livery though, and go through the process of making him look a bit more used, let's quit the talking and see this guy in action. You've probably seen him in the background of videos, running the railway while others had their spotlights. It's about time this guy gets his own too. Ladies and gentlemen, the perfect double-O scale Percy. Or at least he is to me. And as you could expect, like every other model, this guy has a story to him too. And here's how his goes. So when it comes to Percy in HO or double-O scale, your options aren't great, honestly. In my opinion, Bachman Percy just isn't a good runner, and while it achieves an overall look, it is such a headache to get actually accurate. Then of course you have Hornby, which is closer but uses a pocket rocket chassis, and also has its own accuracy issues. If you really want an accurate Percy, your best bet is 3D printing, and that's how this guy was brought to life by my good friend Trainstorm1225. I had been sitting on a Hornby W4 Peckett chassis for a while, and after even more back and forth about what Percy could be, I decided to give it to the hands of a professional and commissioned Trainstorm to make a Percy that's similar to his models. While I like to make more unique variants of the engines, he excels greatly in actual accurate engines. And if I was going to have one screen accurate-ish engine, it was going to be Percy. So I sent the Peckett chassis his way and very quickly he got to work. This Percy is made using Gauge 1 files made by Jamos Trains that were shrunk down and squished to fit the W4 chassis. And one of my favorite features, which you may not have noticed yet, is his sound and cab area. Not only does he have little red curtains that are actually made of cloth, but a little bit of interior detailing, and this is also where the speaker for those sounds are. He can puff, has a brake sound, can talk, but sadly my DCC controller is currently broken so I can only show off a limited amount of sounds. Thankfully, however, Percy runs well on DC as well. So don't worry, I'll show you what I can. 
Now, you may be wondering why Percy doesn't have sixes, and believe it or not, that is intentional and can be changed on the chance I ever want to. My initial idea for this Percy was just a smaller, accurate Percy 250 W4 chassis, but that kinda ended up evolving into a early Percy, or one that was just purchased from Topham. So this is kinda made to represent before he could have the six, but also a time he was still on Sodor. One of my favorite Percy scenes is when Topham buys him anyway, so if anything, I like to think it's a nod to that, even though Percy had his sixes in that scene. Don't worry about it. If I'm honest, I don't have much to say about Percy besides that. And again, I think he's perfect. Trainstorm blew every expectation I had out of the water with this model, and honestly made my dream come true of actually owning an accurate Percy model in double O skill. I mean, I, that's, that's kind of hard to do, if that wasn't highlighted already. But again, if I'm honest, that's really all I can say. I provided a chassis and the idea. He's the one who got hands-on and really made it, so I figure if anyone can explain that process, it's probably him. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me hand the mic off over to the man himself, and let's see how he brought this little green bug to life. Hello, everyone. Before how I get into I Built Percy, I'd like to introduce myself. My name's Carter, also known as Trainstorm on YouTube and on Twitter, and I create models of Thomas and his friends in double O scale. A few months ago, Trainboy had messaged me about an interesting idea he had, a model of Percy, but on a Hornby Peckett chassis. After Brainstorm got this idea, we decided that Lance would send me the chassis while I'd build the body. Once I'd received the chassis, I tested my own Percy body on it, and I didn't like how it looked, and I wanted it shortened. Using the files made by Jamos Tranos as a test, and after some experimenting, I rather printed the body that we were happy with. I first began to smoothen out the body and secure it to the chassis for easier handling and smoother running. Once that was all done, I went on to painting. It's always a good idea to prime your models beforehand, so for this I used Tamiya Light Grey with some standing in between coats for a smoother finish. For a more Season 2 styled Percy, which is what we decided to go for, I decided that Tamiya TS35 Part Green would look best with that darker shade. And after a quick spray, I was pretty happy with it. The running board was sprayed with PS2 and the rest of the model as well as the smaller detailings were hand painted with acrylic. Percy also features some cab detailing using a file made by at Scar Lowey Boy and some curtains that were done using some red ribbon. Next up were some final details including custom vinyl lining, a real color, and even some brass whistles by Ian's train things on Shapeways. If you're wondering why Percy doesn't feature his iconic number 6, that's because we had decided to go for a more pre-Sodor style model after it had just been purchased by Topham. After a quick clear coat, Percy was complete. At least on the outside. Under the hood though, this guy is fully loaded with DCC and sound. This was achieved by using an ESU lock sound micro decoder, which allows for custom sounds to be programmed, all being from the show itself. Major thank you to at BGM Reviews, who programmed the chuff and idle sounds. It definitely saved me a lot of time. Percy's sounds include his iconic whistle, including the one from Magic Railroad, his original season 1 theme, a voice line from the CGI series, and even another interesting remix. I did attempt lights, though due to the size of the model and limited space, it just wasn't possible at the time. Though hopefully someday we can have another attempt. After some test runs at the local club, Percy was ready. This was probably the most challenging yet most fun model I've made and a big thank you to Lance for wanting to work with me and having me on. We've got another project in the works, so please stay tuned. That's all for me, I hope you guys enjoyed this short explanation. Take care everyone. Massive thank you again to Trainstorm for not only making this guy, but also coming on to explain what I couldn't. Be sure to not only subscribe, but follow him on his socials, all linked in the description. And now, with all of that being said, let's finally see this dude in action.
Some model projects are just, what's a good way to put this, simpler, easier, maybe recommended for anyone to give a shot. And today we're talking about one of them. Winston is one of those newer CGI-only Thomas characters that essentially serves as Sir Topham Hatt's personal rail car, maybe rail inspection car, kind of all of the above. Railed road vehicle that is no longer a road vehicle. You get what I'm saying. And today I thought we'd talk about my 00 scale Winston, a project I started very recently. Like I said before, a very simple and not too complex project. So don't expect this to be too in depth. The process isn't well, really all that in depth itself. With any luck, it just may inspire you to try the same or maybe show you how simple or easy some of this stuff really can be. But before we jump into how I made my Winston, what the hell is he? Believe it or not, Winston does have a real life basis, or inspiration. This falls on the Type 4B two seat Wickham trolley. And I say this because it helped with my detailing process, and it's always good to get your head around whatever character you're making. From what we can see, he's pretty much just this with some minor modifications. There aren't many models of this trolley specifically around though. So what's the next best thing? Perhaps using a toy. I've seen people in the past use the take along, maybe track master models, and all of these can work in their own way. I however was inspired by Brendan Reese Tin to try this process out with a capsule Winston, since he had done the same thing with his Winston project, and also was all I had at the time, so it, it, it was gonna happen. Capsule Winston is a very, very simple build, and what I found was his axles were pretty much the same with pretty sizable areas already made in the sides for the wheels he has. I'd at least have to gain access to these areas though, and for this I decided to dremel out his bottom, after removing his capsule wheels. If he was gonna run on 00 scale track though, I'd have to be picky about what new wheels fit in, since the previous axles are pretty big, but that doesn't mean there's a lot of playroom. I did end up getting pretty lucky with my first pick though. I tried to find the smallest HO scale wheels I could find, and landed on 26 inch front bogey truck wheels. Bought the pack, slipped them in, and it was a go. They fit pretty snugly where the capsule wheels used to be. I did have to sand down those old areas just a tad to accommodate turns though. But like I said, this process really wasn't much at all. Next came keeping those wheels in the chassis, and for that, I literally just used a bit of card. Cut it down, glued it in the front, back, and middle, painted it a matte black, and surprisingly, it holds the wheels very well. I expected this to be more a temporary thing, but I haven't had an issue yet, so eh, not gonna lie, it's kind of stuck. If it works, it works. And next came this dude's actual body, which also was very simple. Winston in the show has a very detailed interior, and the capsule, well, to accommodate the capsule Sir Topham hat is simply not. That doesn't mean we can't do a little more though, so I decided to hand paint that area a matte black. I've also realized a little bit before, Winston doesn't have a windshield or windshield wipers. Or I guess wiper, he only has one in the show, so that would have to be made and accommodated too. His windshield is just a piece of spare plastic cut down to fit the frame, nothing too special. Interestingly though, his windshield wiper was made of a hairpin cut down, bent, and glued back together, then primed and painted a matte black as well, and applied to the front. I tried to follow the design of Winston's actual windshield wipers, but being this small, I'm just happy to have managed what I did. 
So with that complete, those two areas were done as well. I felt like his lamps needed a pit of life too, so I painted the front of those a bright white. And just before I painted his wheels a matte black, decided... Kinda just not to. I know in the show Winston does have black wheels, and this may be something I change over time, but something about the silver wheels with the silver lamps and current look... I, I don't know, it just works to me. So for now at least, those are pretty much as is. I sealed it all with a coat of matte clear, and now only need to find him some new horns. Unfortunately with capsules, most detail is just a sticker, so at the very least I can make those better. For now though, this is Winston. And before anyone asks, no he is not, I don't know how you would manage to power a capsule, but uh, if I do figure something out, I'll let you know, I pro I'll, you'll be the first to know, I gotcha. At least to me, he doesn't have to be. He's here, and causing all the trouble he should be, and that matters a little more. I'll keep experimenting with new ways of doing such, and again, if I ever do crack something, I'll let you guys know. But for now, this is my 00 scale model of Winston. I'll probably weather him up just a little bit when he does get his horns, maybe go back in detail some more, or paint the wheels. But regardless, I'm pretty satisfied with his current standing, and double excited for Pacman Rebecca too, so she can push this guy around. And like I said before, hopefully this video highlighted the simplicity in projects like this. There's always the route of 3D printing, and I may try that myself one day with Winston, but to me, it's always a little more fun to give something a new purpose. And now, this little capsule guy has just that. And hopefully you guys enjoyed figuring out the process. Either, either, either subscribe, donate, or get the fuck out.